Take your Bibles. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Just started last Sunday a new series in this great Old Testament book, the book of Daniel. We noted how that they were carried away into Babylon as captives. Nebuchadnezzar and his armies defeated the Israelites and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and took many of their young people back to Babylon in captivity. And Brother Matt mentioned last Sunday night how that taking them back and trying to mold them into what they wanted them to be. The world's always doing that. Always seeking to mold us into its image. And we need to be like Daniel, who refused to be shaped by this world. But we've got to take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to do it every day. Does it disturb you that there are professing believers who let the world dictate who they are, what they do? Godly standards are lowered and abandoned by many today who've accepted what the world has to offer. I think one great lesson in the book of Daniel is we, we have an example here, not only of Daniel, but of his three comrades, of young men, actually teenagers, who refuse to be molded into what the world thinks we should be. You know, we see that in churches today. There are a lot of churches today that are seeker-friendly. Ever, ever heard that term? Seeker-friendly or seeker-sensitive. They justify Adopting worldly methods, bringing that into the church. Wanting to become more like the church, they think that by becoming like the world, we can win the world. But that doesn't work. We lose our true purpose and distinction when we do that. We cannot become like the world and win them. That's never been God's method for reaching this world with the gospel. So Daniel could have easily yielded to the plans of Nebuchadnezzar. And he could have justified it like we often do today. He could have said to himself, well, if I become like the Babylonians, then they will accept me and listen to me and I can tell them about Jehovah. But he knew that wouldn't work. He chose a different path. And here's the thing I want you to remember. We're studying about Daniel today because he took that path. We don't know the names of all the others. Those that allowed the Babylonians to mold them to be like them, we don't know who they are. Their names were not kept. But we know about Daniel and his three friends because they stayed true to the word of God. If he had gone along with the Babylonian plan, we never would have heard of him. Let's look at this. In, in Daniel chapter 1, we're going to begin reading with verse number 8 and read to the end of the chapter. It says, And Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs, that he might not defile himself. Now part of the thing they were doing is back in verse 5, the king appointed them their daily provision of, of uh, food and drink. And uh, this is what he's doing. He, he does not want to subject himself to the diet of the Babylonians because it would defile him. It says in verse 9, Now God had brought Daniel into favor, and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your face worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye be, uh, make me endanger my head to the king. Said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had sent over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat 
and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. In all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even to the first year of King Cyrus. And we'll learn later that the, the, Medi, the Medes come in and conquer the Babylonians and uh, King Cyrus was king of the Medes and Persians. So all through his life, Daniel was faithful and true to his God. So let's think about these four. We're going to call them the Vegetarian Quartet. Not that I'm pushing vegetarianism or anything, but uh, you see the diet that they uh, accepted. Pulse was basically a vegetable plate. They just ate vegetables, no meat. So if you want to take notes, let's, let's think about this. First of all, I want you to note their bold decision here. Their bold decision. The words, but Daniel, includes his three friends. You'll see in verse 11 that plural pronouns are used in the rest of the story. So evidently these other three joined with Daniel. He was kind of the leader. He took the initiative in taking this matter to the eunuchs. But they all decided to take this stand. They made a bold decision here. Now you know that life is a series of decisions, right? We live on the basis of decisions that we make every day. Somebody said what we are today is a result of the decisions we made in the past, right? What we'll be in the future We'll be determined on the decisions we make today. So it's very important for us to make wise decisions. Now Daniel is facing a crisis in his life. He's about to make a great decision. And it's because he made the right decision we're, we're talking about him. He made a bold decision not to go along with the king's plan. In the opening chapters of this book, you see a series of tests here. In chapter 1, there's a test of the believer's walk, how we walk in this world. In chapter 2, there's a test of the believer's witness. In chapter 3, there's a test of the believer's worship. And we got a great example in Daniel in all three of these areas. They made the right decision. They would not defile themselves by accepting the ways of the Babylonians. And by application, we do not need to accept the ways of this world. Amen? How could they make this decision? First, we, we see their convictions. These young men had some convictions. Daniel purposed in his heart. Now take note of that. See, all real decisions are heart decisions. He purposed in his heart. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Guard your heart. Be careful what you feed upon, what you listen to. The Bible says in Proverbs 23.26, says, This is God saying, My son, give me thine heart. 
Give me thine heart. That's what God wants. He wants your heart. Amen. Because if he's got your heart, he's got all of you. My son, give me thine heart. Let thine eyes observe my ways. Now, the captors, they could change some things about these young men. They changed their residence. They're now in Babylon instead of Jerusalem. They changed their names, right? Gave them Babylonian names. They changed their dress. There are some things that they were able to change, but they could not change their hearts. Now think about that. We are in our hearts what we really are. We say, preacher, why did they refuse to eat the king's food? What was the problem here? Well, the Mosaic law was very clear and strict about the diet of the Jews. There were, there were certain foods that were considered unclean. That they were not allowed to eat. Make a note in, in Leviticus chapter 11. Just write that down. I don't have time to go into that. But if you want to go there sometime, maybe this afternoon, you'll see a list there. A list of animals, fish, and fowl that were acceptable. And then there were those that were prohibited. They were not allowed to eat certain things. They, uh, they could eat camel steaks. When's the last time you had a good camel steak? That's okay. But they couldn't have any ham, no pork chops, no bacon. Breakfast in Israel stinks. <laughs> I mean, you cannot have breakfast without pork. There's just no way. You've got to have some ham and eggs and bacon. We've been to Israel. You know what they have for breakfast? Raw fish. Salad, breakfast stinks in Israel. I'm glad I'm a Gentile. You know, I'm suspicious that the Babylonians probably enjoyed pork. They had good breakfast in, in Babylon. That was before Islam came to Iraq, okay? You know, Islam's the same way about pork, but uh, they didn't come along a long, lot later than this to the Middle East. Anyway. Because of their diet, they could not eat the things the Babylonians ate. That was unclean to them. And another reason was the way they would prepare the meat. Even if the meat was proper, the Babylonians would not prepare it right. You heard the word kosher. Kosher is the diet of the Jews. It's not only the food that they were allowed to eat, but how that food was prepared. There's a certain way that you would prepare. The, the Jewish butcher had a special way of preparing the meat. You couldn't strangle something. It had, the blood had to be shed. There's a lot of things like that involved. So there's no way that they could eat the food that they were being served because it would not be kosher. It might be meat sacrificed to idols, which they feel would, be, would defile them spiritually. So these four refused to eat the diet of the Babylonians. The others did, evidently. All the, you know, there's thousands of young Jews taken into Babylonian captivity. And it seemed like all the others didn't have any problem with this. They ate what was put before them. They probably felt like they had no choice. And after all, everybody else is doing it. Isn't that a good excuse? Everybody else is doing it. And I imagine these four maybe faced some peer pressure from the others. When they say, no, we're not going to eat that. No, they're saying, now, wait a minute, guys. Don't make such a big deal out of this. Let's, let's make it easy on ourselves. Nobody expects us to keep the law of Moses here in Babylon. Come on, let's not be fanatics about this. Right? You know the saying, when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do. Right? They might have said, anyway... Didn't our God abandon us? Allow us to be taken into captivity? Why be loyal to a God like that anyway? Peer pressure. You ever face peer pressure? To go along with everybody else? It's tough to go against that, isn't it? 
to be ridiculed and mocked for taking a stand. But Daniel and his three buddies would not compromise their convictions. God's commandments were not to be broken, no matter what the circumstances may be. By the way, do you know there's a difference between a conviction and a preference? According to the United States Supreme Court, there's a difference between a conviction and a preference. They define a preference as a strong belief, but it will change under the right circumstances. That's a preference. If there's peer pressure, family influence, lawsuits, threat of jail, you might change your mind. If it's just a preference. But a conviction is something else. A conviction is something that you have purposed in your heart that you will never compromise about. That's a conviction. Convictions will show up. Refraining from defiling myself with the king's food, that's not a preference. That's a conviction. Do you have any convictions? Uh, conviction is something you'll die for. You won't die for a preference. You got any convictions that you'll never compromise? I hope so. You look very pious. I think you're you're with me here. Not only do we see their convictions, we see their commitment. Their refusal to eat the king's meat and drink his wine reveals some depths of commitment to God and to God's word. They're going to serve God. They're going to honor God. They're going to obey God's word no matter what. It was more than just a religious practice to these guys. It was a, a purpose in their lives. Nothing could cause them to abandon their faith. What would you have done? I mean, just be honest with yourself. Put yourself in their place. What would you have done? Would you have just gone along? Would you have taken a stand? Do you live by preference or by convictions? Is your commitment to Christ non-negotiable? See, a couple of you nodding your heads. Some are like the fellow who was asked, he said, well, what kind of flower do you have that in your lapel? He said, it's a chrysanthemum. The guy said, well, it looks like a rose. No, it's a chrysanthemum. He said, well, spell it. He said, well, it's a, a C-H-R, no, it's a, it's a K, K-H-R, no, it's a, you think you're right, it is a rose. <laughs> R-O-S-E. He wasn't committed to his flower, was he? Sometimes our commitments will wither. When they're challenged. But these young men, I mean, they, they could really be punished for refusing to eat what the king has placed before them. Sometimes you've got to pay a price to be true to your convictions. But let me remind you is there not a price to pay for disobeying God's will? The Bible says in Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said this. He said, fear not, what, not, fear not men which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear God. That's the beginning of wisdom, isn't it? 
to fear God. Some violate God's commandments, maybe for a job promotion, maybe to make a big sale, to buckle under peer pressure. Some let the situation dictate what they're going to do. But not this four. They're going to take a stand, no matter what. That's what heroes are made of, isn't it? An eminent preacher once asked a famous English actor, he said, I wish you could explain something to me. You appear before great crowds night after night with your acting, with fiction, and the crowds just pour in to see you. I'm preaching the essential, unchangeable truth of God's Word, and I can hardly get a crowd at all. He said, can you explain that? The actor said, well, it's quite simple. I present fiction as though it were truth. You present truth as though it were fiction. Don't look at me like that. I'm not talking about me. I hope I'm not talking about me. I hope I'm presenting the truth with some conviction. Some church members treat God's word as though it were fiction and not the truth. Amen? I mean, many say they believe the Bible's inspired word of God, but they won't live by it. They never share their faith, which Christ commissioned us to do. They don't have a bit of problem robbing God of his day of worship, of his time, of the glory that's due unto him. Secondly, note their bland diet. Daniel voiced his convictions and commitment he asked if he could be excused from defiling himself with the king's meat and wine. And God goes to work. God touches the heart of this one placed over them and makes him sympathetic to their plight. Now his sympathy is overshadowed by his fear of the king. He's not going to put himself in too much jeopardy here. But there's something he said that kind of opened the door for Daniel. Uh, look at their proposal again, verses 11 through 15. They proposed that just let us eat pulse for 10 days. We'll just eat vegetables and drink water. And after 10 days, you can examine us to see whether or not we look well and healthy. Just let us go on a low-carb diet. Give us a jug of water. And I guarantee you, we'll look as healthy as a horse. We'll look like Hercules. So the official goes along with this. Verse 10 says, your faces, by the way. So Daniel's three friends are involved here. Daniel takes a stand that influences the others to follow him. Do you know you influence people? Now you influence them either to the good or the bad. But we do influence other people. Keep in mind, these are just teenagers. 14, 15 years old. Do we need some Daniels in our youth group? We might have some Daniels in our youth group. Some of you folks are real faithful. I think you try to live what you believe. But dare to be a Daniel. You, know, you teenagers don't have to sow your wild oats. Don't ever be deceived in that garbage. Just sow your wild oats. I had a good friend. His name was Monty. Monty graduated high school. His father was a pastor. 
Might have trying to decide what to do with his life. He didn't really want to go to college. He was tired of school. So he's thinking about going into the army. One of the deacons of his father's church took him aside and said, here, here's what you ought to do. Go ahead and join the army and sow your wild oats. For three or four years in the army, drink, chase women, have a good time. Then come home and settle down and serve the Lord. I'm glad we don't have deacons like that. But you know what? Monty took his advice. He joined the army. He drank with his buddies. He went whoring with his buddies. One night he woke up with a, a woman he didn't know. He picked up the night before. She got pregnant. Out of obligation, he married her. She is a wild cat. It didn't last. They ended up in divorce. Destroyed his life. Years later, I was talking to him, and he said, Dwight, he said, when I was a teenager, God called me into the ministry. God wanted me to preach the gospel. Now I can't. I'm a divorced man. I can't pastor a church. He said, I ruined my life because I listened to some bad advice. Hey, you be careful the kind of advice you give these kids. You be very careful. You better make sure it's good, wise, biblical advice. And you be careful what advice you listen to. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 12, 1, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, that thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. This world's not going to satisfy you. It can't. Be careful. Not only we see their proposal, we see their proving. Prove them 10 days. After 10 days, they look better than all the rest. They look healthier, they look stronger, wiser. See, Daniel had a tremendous faith in God, and he believed God would honor his obedience. And God did not fail him. Melzar was so pleased that we read in verse 16 that he allows them to continue on their kosher diet. And because of their faithful commitment to God, they were blessed by the Lord. And God providentially cared for them. Now, folks, I want to remind you again, the world is always trying to prove us. Whether or not we will pass the test of our faith. They'll test you to see if you'll drink with them, to run with them. They'll say, come on, just try it once. Don't be a holy Joe. Right? What are you afraid of? We can say I'm afraid of a holy God. That's what I'm afraid of. I don't want to disobey my God. I do not want to defile the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's what you can say. Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. Third thing I want you to see is note their, their blessed distinctiveness. Verses 17 through 21. You know, God says in the Bible, 1 Samuel 2.30, I want you to take this home with you. God says, them that honor me, I will honor. Now, if you don't get anything else today, get that. God says, them that honor me, I will honor. God will honor your faith. You know that? You put God first in your life, you honor God, 
God is going to honor you. I'm not talking a prosperity gospel. I'm not talking about making you rich or anything like that. But God will bless your life. There's many ways God can bless your life. And this vegetarian quartet is a wonderful example of that. Two thoughts here in closing. How they were favored by the Lord. Verse 17. God made these boys the valedictorians of the class. They uh, graduate with honors. Right? He gave them amazing ability to understand dreams and visions. Hey, do you want to excel in school? Obey God. Let God bless you with wisdom and understanding. James 1, 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That giveth to all liberally, and upbraideth not. It shall be given him. Ask God. Seek wisdom from God. Tell you what, go to, go to Psalm 119 with me real quick. Or oh, real slow, I don't care. Psalm 119. Look at verse 98. You know what Psalm 119 is about, right? It's the longest chapter in the Bible, and it's all about the Word of God. About how wonderful the Word of God is. And in verse 98, Thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they're ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. Y'all probably feel that way, don't you? For thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I refrain my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, look at this, therefore I hate every false way. And that's what wisdom and understanding will do. You'll hate the false ways of this world. They'll have no appeal to you. Now, you'd have thought Daniel wrote those words. Because it seems to define Daniel, doesn't it? Daniel kept God's commandments. He hated every false way, and God made him wiser than all the wise men of Babylon. How they were favored by the Lord and how they were found by the king. Verses 18 through 20. Three years later, remember back in verse 5, they were going to do this for three years before they would come before King Nebuchadnezzar. So they're probably, what, about 18 years old now, three years later. And they're brought before the king to be examined. Not only were they found to be the best of the lot, they were ten times better than all of his magicians and astrologers. They finished at the top of their class. God blessed them. Why? Because they honored God. Therefore, God honored them. If you want to live a life that bears the mark of eternity on it, then do what these four did. You draw a line in the dirt and say, here I stand. My convictions are based upon the word of God and nothing's going to alter them. No matter what. Rachel was conducting a final rehearsal of his great choir, the production of Messiah. They sang through the point where there was a soprano solo taking up the refrain, I know that my Redeemer liveth. The soloist sang her part. Her technique was perfect. Accurate note placing, flawless enunciation. After the final note, all the eyes of the choir looked to the choir director for approval. He walked over to the young lady. He said, my girl, do you really know 
that your Redeemer liveth? She said, yes, I, I, I believe I do. He said, then sing it. Sing it from the heart. Show us that you know the Redeemer, that he's real to you. So they sang it again. And this time, she sang it from the heart. When she finished, there wasn't a dry eye in the choir. And the conductor said, now I believe you do know your Redeemer. It makes a difference. These four stayed faithful their entire lives. They weren't just faithful for a while and then backslid. All the way through, different kingdoms came and went, different administrations, different kings, but they stayed true all the way through their lives. We're going to learn more about them as we go along. There's other tests that you're going to have to face. The Bible says, 1 John 2, 17, The world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Hey, do you know the Redeemer? Is he your Redeemer? Can people see that you know the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. As Brother Sam, musicians come, prepare for an invitation. You know, the world dubbed the Beatles as the Fab Four, right? Now, I think these three are the Fab Four. Daniel and his comrades lived a fabulous life. If you know the Lord, then I hope this will inspire you to want to emulate them. Live in such a way that others will know that it's real in your life. Now, it's going to be necessary to say no a lot. You're going to have to say no to a lot of temptations of this world. But dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. As we stand together, you know, the invitation is decision time. We started off talking about making decisions. But now it's time, I think, for some of you to make a decision. You need to obey God's will for your life, whether it be for salvation or for baptism, church membership, rededication. Maybe God's calling you into a ministry. It's decision time. Be wise in making those decisions.